Well, good morning, Crossing Church. Uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you so much for being here. If you're a guest, I hope you got to meet some people on the way in. And uh, there's a gift bag out there at the uh, welcome table. So grab one on the way out if you haven't. Uh, just talks about who we are, what we believe, and um, a little bit of a present in there uh, from us. Uh, let me start with some prayer. Father. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to worship you. As we listen to these songs, it's hard, um, it's hard for them to be worship songs, to be honest, Father. They, they, they're just Christmas songs. and I just ask that you would help us to hear the words in them and to realize that all of these are songs that that coming from our lips, our adoration of you, our worship. We love you, Father. Thank you so much for sending us your Son. I pray that this morning that you would continue to help us see just how amazing, just how amazing Jesus is. Help us to understand. Help us to see more clearly. And I pray that it would um, affect our lives this morning. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so we have, uh, so we're on week three. We're going to finish this thing up next uh, Sunday in the evening at 6 p.m. Christmas Eve Eve here. Don't show up here at this time on Sunday morning because we will not be here. Uh, well, somebody might be here, but. Um, so, and what we've been doing, we've been walking through titles and roles and names that Jesus has taken on, right? And so we saw two weeks ago that he took on this, this um, the name kind of, or the title Elohim, uh, this creator God. And we saw that, that Jesus was actually in creation, that all things were created by him and for him and through him. And then we saw last week, we, we dove into some Hebrew, right? And we, and we looked at the name Yahweh and we saw that Jesus took on this name of Yahweh and that he did that for two very polar, polar reasons, right? One, on one hand, he's saying that he's self-existent, that he is the I am, that he is a self-existent being, that he doesn't find his definition from anything else. He was not created. He has always existed. But then on the other hand, we see this God who wants to know us, wants us to know him, and wants this relationship. Well, this morning, we're going to take those, and we're going to kind of go, okay. So what does that mean for us? How, how does that then translate into our lives? And what we're going to see is exactly what we just sang about, that he is Lord at his birth. The Greek word for Lord is kurios. You might have seen it in that, in that splash screen, but the Greek word is kurios. And, and we're going to dive into that word, Lord. He takes on that title over and over again. And in particular, and we talked about it last week, when you see Lord with a capital L and lowercase O-R-D, that's the word that we're talking about here this morning. And so we're going to see, like, what does that mean? We use that word, I mean, there's probably, I hope, I don't think there's anybody else you identify as Lord in your life, right? Probably, it's not a common term. But what is a common term is sir or master, maybe not as often, um, but that's the same word, and, and, and we're going to kind of see what, that, what does that mean for us if this Jesus, this baby in the manger, is Lord at his birth? How, what does that mean for our lives, that the creator of the universe that wants this relationship with us, we also should address and see as our master, as our Lord? All right, so like I said, um, there's no... There's, that word is very common. The, it's all throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, the word in Hebrew is Adonai. And if you remember last week, I talked a little bit about how Adonai got mixed with Yahweh a little bit in, uh, with the, the Jews. But for our sake, Adonai and Kyrios, these are the terms that are referred to, and in particular in the New Testament, to Jesus as Lord, Master, Sir, it's, it's not, there's no divine implication in it. When somebody says that word, they're not saying, 
that Jesus is the creator when they say Lord. They just aren't. They're, they're saying sir. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of authority. And you, and you can read through it. There's a lot of people that are referred to as Lord. Um, and that's where we get the expression that he's the Lord of Lords, right? Like this idea that he is beyond all of those. So, so what does that mean for us? I mean, if, his, if this is just some like, there's not, I mean, it's a very common word. But it should draw our attention that, that what, we've been, what we talked about last week, and I think what we talk about often at Christmas, is the soft, warm, cuddly love of Christ. And it's true. And we, we talked about that part. But we've also talked about there's a lot of facets of Christ. And there's a lot of facets of God. And so what we're going to see today is that this relationship isn't just one of love but it's one of obedience. It's one of seeing Jesus as the authority figure in our lives, the sole authority figure. That no matter what temporary authority might be over us, Jesus should be seen as our ultimate authority. And so that's kind of what we're going to be digging into this morning. And what, you, what you'll find is that Obedience is throughout scriptures, and we don't like the word obedience, do we? <laughs> I mean, I like it for my kids, but I don't like it for me. Um, I mean, for those, I mean, most of you know I'm in the military as well, right? And so people call me sir, I call other people sir or ma'am. There's a, there, and some people, I mean, they have to. <laughs> like, like if they don't, they get in trouble. I mean, there, so there's some part of that from a military perspective that we see is kind of just brought into customs. And, I mean, we're in the South, right? And so some of you raise up your kids with um, sir and ma'am, like pretty, pretty uh, consistently. And that's a great thing. I don't know what happened with my kids. No, I'm just joking. Sorry, girls. Um, it, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm from the West Coast. Um, so, and so when we look at that, we, we see that this is a, it's a consistent, it's a reminder of authority. And it makes us squirm, right? Because we're in America, <laughs> and we have freedom, and freedom is above and beyond all things. I mean, really, that's kind of our mindset, that we want freedom above everything else. And I know some of you are like, I might not make it out of here today. But, but is freedom really what we are attaining? Is that really our goal? You see, I, I would argue that none of us are free. I would argue that we're slaves. And you can be either a slave to your stomach and your minds and your emotions and your passions, or you can be a slave to Christ. Those, those are our options. We, we have no neutral ground. I mean, you can, you can pretend like you do, but you don't. We don't. And the Bible tells us we don't. That's why the Bible is very clear that, that Christ paid for us, that he purchased us. We are his possession. It's a whole different way of thinking about freedom when we're like, well, he's my authority. And we're not going to talk a whole lot about freedom in Christ, but the reality is, is that what we'll find is that when we obey, when we see Christ as our authority, we find actual freedom, true freedom. Not the fake freedom we think we know about. Not the freedom to go and just do whatever we want, spend our money on our pleasures and, and enjoy life. That's not, I know that we think that that's freedom, but all we're doing is enslaving ourselves to those things. And so freedom in Christ is a whole different dimension, right? It's a whole different thing where Christ, us taking on the, the role of identifying Christ as our master actually gives us freedom. And so we're going to dive into what this obedience looks like. And we're going to be reading from the ESV. The verses will be on the slide. We're going to start off in Luke chapter 6. Verse 46. Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? 
This is coming off of Jesus talking about the tree and its fruit. And he's saying, like, if you're a good tree, you're going to produce good fruit. If you're a bad tree, you're going to produce bad fruit. What do you obey? What do you, what's the authority figure in your life? And so what we, what we see here is that he takes on, he, he identifies this title, Lord. He's like, you're calling me Lord. He even says it twice, right? So like the mental image there is somebody coming up to him, kind of begging, right? Like, Lord, Lord. He's like, why are you coming to me if you don't do what I say? Why, why am I your authority figure when you need something, but not your authority figure when you don't? Right? When, we, when we live our lives and our lives are going great and everything's fantastic, that position of lordship of Christ in our lives kind of moves to the side often. And we take on that role of Lord of our own lives. So he says, why do you come to me and call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? He's saying, like, that doesn't make any sense. And then read on in verse 47, he says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been built, because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. This is a great parable. Because Jesus is saying that, that this house, right? Like we're the house in this parable. He's the foundation. He's the rock. In fact, to be more clear, he goes, obedience is that foundation and that rock. But what's his focus in this? What does he want? Well, I mean, in the parable, he's saying like survival of the house is what matters. Right? He's saying, how do you get your house to survive? It's a very practical matter. You see, obedience is for our sake. It's not just God establishing some set of rules and going, let's see if they can do it. It's for our sake. And we understand that, right? If you have, if you have kids, hopefully... You establish rules in your house, I hope. And those rules are hopefully for your kids' sake, for some aspect of their, their growth, their maturity, their safety. There's some reason why you created that rule. It's for their sake. Now, what's interesting, though, is that sometimes, as humans, <laughs> those rules kind of morph. And we start to enforce rules because they're the rules, <laughs> right? And we go, no, 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 you need to follow the rule because I said so. We stop, we, we move, we tend to move away from that, this is for your sake, and we move into the, you just need to obey. And it's kind of us trying to secure our authority, really. But what Jesus is saying here is, is the rules are not... It, he doesn't care about the code that you're building the building with. He doesn't care about the, you know, the number of nails per inch or anything like that. He's, he doesn't care about that. He cares about the survival of the house. And he says, and if you just obeyed me, you would survive. Survive what? The rage of the streams, right? The, the, the water breaking against the house. That's the world. He's like, it's going to happen. Like, it's going to happen. It happens in both sides, right? The house that's well built and the house that isn't well built. Bad things are going to happen to both. They're just going to happen. One of them is going to get scorched and melt by the fire. The other one is going to get refined. I think I did that backwards. Right? Like, you're going to have the house that's built on the foundation 
is going to be refined through the fire. It's going to be purified. It's going to be strengthened. And on the other side, it's going to collapse. It's going to melt. Right? It's the same analogy, and we see it throughout the Bible. And we see in this scenario, this, these waters are just going to crush this house, and then the waters are not, are not going to do anything to this house. And it's all based on what? Our obedience. Say, Lord, Lord, why don't you do what I say? It's for your sake. And then Luke continues on, and he gives us an example here. The centurion. So a centurion is like it's just a Roman soldier. And it says, after he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him. All right. So you have the centurion. He just hears about Jesus. We don't really have a whole lot. We don't know. Like, it doesn't sound like the centurion has like, been baptized. He hasn't gotten, put, placed his faith in Christ. Like, this is just kind of, he hears about Jesus. And what does he do? He sends the elders, the Jewish elders. He's a Roman guard. And he goes, hey, you guys, go, go call Jesus. I have a servant. And what does it say about the servant? He's valuable. <laughs> This is a very military discussion, right? He's, he's very much like, I am in charge. You people, go get Jesus. This guy, I, I can't lose him, right? There's, there's a lot of authority in this story. It says, and Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house... The centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I, too, am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And so what we saw here, though, is this centurion, while he has this authority, seems to be a good man. Seems to be, right? He, he sends these guys away, and he goes, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. I'm not worthy for this. Now, the elders, right? They're like, he's worthy. He's worthy. And then he goes, I'm not worthy, right? And so there's this interesting contrast here, a little bit of humility of this centurion. And so he's got this authority But then he says, Jesus, he sends, and it says in verse 7 there, he then sends his friends. So he sent the the Jewish elders, right, and say, tell Jesus to come here. And then he sends his friends and tell them to stop. I don't know what's going on with this guy. He's not very good in the military. He's a little indecisive. But you know what's interesting? He never meets Jesus. At least in Luke, like, He never actually meets him. It's all like sending letters and telegrams or whatever, right? And this is the conversation that he ends up having with Jesus. And this is how he interacts with him. But look at what he says there in verse 7, or in verse 6. Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. You see, you got to imagine that everybody wanted to meet Jesus. You would think. Right? Especially everybody that had a need. Everybody that was going up to him going, Lord, Lord. Right? Everybody was like, man, this guy can do things. Maybe he can do something for you. You can, you can see how this could become very consumeristic very quickly. Look what he says in verse 7. Say the word and my servant will be healed. You see, he recognized something about Jesus that others hadn't. 
They saw Jesus as this great gift giver. This like grandfather that was just like, hey, let me, I'll just give you whatever you need. What, what else? You want more candy? That's how, that's how a lot of people saw Jesus. But this centurion, this Roman guard goes, no, no, no. Just say the word. You have authority. You see, I, I actually think there's a little bit of like parody there. I think the, I think the Roman guard is kind of like, I think Jesus and I, we're, we're kind of on the same level. Like people call you sir, people call me sir. We're, we're all about the same. Lord, Lord, right? I mean, that's probably, I mean, and it would, certainly would not have been um, unfamiliar for this centurion to be called Lord. Exact same word. Would have happened all the time. And so there's a little bit of probably like equals to some extent here. And what, so what the centurion says is, no, just say the word. You see, the centurion knows that he has authority. The centurion knows that if you have authority, then you command obedience. And look what it says here in verse 9. When Jesus heard these things... He marveled at him and turning to the crowd that followed him said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Where was faith in there? It's taken me a while on this one. I'm like, why does Jesus see faith in the centurion? It's because he says, say the word. You see, the centurion understood that authority, with authority came obedience. He understood that those were correlated. He understood that, that, that there's this, um, that this obedience is part of faith, that that. Whoever ends up obeying, right, whether this was sickness or people or whatever, that this obedience was part of this faith. And in fact, if you read the first chapter of, uh, sorry, Romans 2.15, and then you read Romans 16.26, uh, I believe it is, both of those talks about obedience in faith. You see, and so the centurion sees and believes that Jesus can do these things because it's just a matter of fact, because you're Lord, because you're a master, because you have authority. I just don't think we see Christ like that very often. We see him as our Savior. We see him, especially this time of year, as the baby in the manger. We see all of these things, but the reality is, is that he commands obedience. And not only does he command obedience for our sake, but he commands obedience, and that's part of our faith. I had a quote in here somewhere, but I lost it. It's part of our faith. If you read like A.W. Tozer, he has some incredible stuff that talks about like, man, your faith without obedience. Even the book of James hits this over and over again. You can't look at Jesus and go, Lord, Lord, give me, give me, and not also see him as an authority figure in your life, defining your desires, defining what you do with your time and your resources and your talents. That's what an authority figure does. And so when Jesus takes on this role of Lord, when he's Lord at his birth, like we just sang about, we can't help but going, Lord, what do you desire for me? What do you desire for my life? We aren't autonomous. We are servants of the Most High God. Turn over to the book of John, chapter 15. (laughs) 
verse 7, it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Now we talked about this before, right? When we were going through Mark, that this, this idea of bearing fruit. But look at what it says here, that, that God actually receives glory from it. If you abide in me and my words, abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So he, go, he says, I will, right? I have authority to give. I will. I will do it. It says, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. It's not just receive. It's give. We ought to be living our lives on mission. We ought to be bearing fruit because our authority figure gets glory from this. God is glorified by us producing fruit. And what do we do? We're proving to be disciples. If you guys remember that, that Greek word for disciples is really followers. Disciples of what? Followers of Christ. Because when you bear fruit, when you do the things that Jesus did, then you're going to be glorifying God. Read on verse 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Abide in his love, obey his commandments. the prerequisite. If you obey my commandments, you will abide in my love. You see, that relationship that we talked about last week, this, this relationship that we all desire, that God wants to know us and loves us, exists. It's there. But on the other side, he goes, I need you to obey. Like, you won't experience my love fully if you don't obey my words, my commandments. They're, they're, they're interchangeable. They're, they're facets. They're, the same, they're just different sides of the same Jesus. It's the same relationship. And we see this, right? Like, I mean, even with our kids or with other, uh, well, or maybe our parents, love and obedience, they, they go together. They're inseparable. And then look at what he says in verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Obedience creates joy. That obedience creates joy. See, I don't think we normally think of that, right? Like that's kind of, those are kind of polarizing types of things. We go, no, no, actually, that's not, that's not where I get joy from. But go back to that, that parable of the house. You see, he, he goes, it's for your sake. If you have a house that survives, you're going to be joyful, right? If you have a house that doesn't survive, you're not going to have much joy. And so we see this idea that obedience is for us in this deep, significant sense where this obedience gives us a lasting, eternal joy. And that's where faith comes in, right? I mean, nobody, I mean... Obedience just isn't something we like doing. But we have to trust. We have to trust that, that God says, Hi, these are, these are what, this is what he wants. This is how he wants me to live. This is what he wants me to do. This is, this is where he's pushing me. This is where he's pursuing me. 
Do I, do I turn a blind eye to that or do I, do I go in that direction? Do I, do I respond to God and pursue the same things? Do I follow Christ and obey You see, I I think that's just it. When we look at Jesus' title of Lord, we've got to obey. We see this obedience that comes from faith. Now hear me clearly. Obedience does not save you. It's an obedience in faith. Your faith produces obedience. It's because we believe that we want to live for Christ. It's because we believe that we should be impassioned and that we should pursue the things of Christ. So don't confuse yourselves and don't don't start thinking that, like, I got to do all these things because God told me to do them and this is what I should do. that's, That's an obedience that doesn't have the other part of the relationship, which is love. You guys understand that, right? Like, this is, this is why this world gets this thing so confused, because, we, like I said last week, we can't understand both sides of these things at the same time. We go, okay, he's a loving God. Okay, I got to obey him. I don't understand how I do both of these things. But that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. Look at uh, verse, uh, or chapter 15, verse 40, uh, 14. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. That's, that's Jesus as our authority figure, but also as our friend. He's like, you're my friend, but you have to do what I command. I get it. This is challenging. Nobody likes being told that they have to obey. But that's just the problem. You don't have to obey. You get to obey. And if you struggle with that, if you sit there and you're like, you're just using words here, pray. Pray. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. And what we're going to see next week is that it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to do these things. Like It's impossible for us to obey Christ on our own. And we're going to see next week as Jesus takes on the name Emmanuel, God with us. That he not only commands us to obey, but he then gives us the ability to do it. And he enables us to do it. What, what more do we need? Right? Like, that's ridiculous. That this creating, sustaining, self-defining God desires a relationship with us, a relationship of love, but a relationship that demands obedience and to recognize him as an authority figure in our lives. And so when we start going down these other paths in our lives where we feel like we're getting joy and we feel like we're just getting temporary happiness and fulfillment and we feel better about ourselves for a little bit, he goes, no, 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 obey me. Follow my commands. Live for others, love others. Right? He he summarizes his two greatest commandments in our relationships with each other and our relationship with God, right? That we ought to love God and love each other. It sounds easy, but we all know it is super difficult to do. And that's where the Holy Spirit's going to come in. That's where God's Spirit is going to fill us and give us minds that think about what other people are thinking about, right? Where we we go, man, I, I probably need to pray for them. Maybe they're struggling. Maybe there's something I can do. Right, that, that's that life, that's following Christ. So obedience. Well, I mean, it provides us with so much. 
You just got to get over that hurdle of going, I don't like somebody telling me what to do. And Jesus is going, just jump over the hurdle and you're going to find so much more joy on this side. You know, this morning, if, if you're like, man, I, I struggle with this and I don't know, and I don't, I don't know that I've got the faith to do that, I, I would just, I mean, God is faithful to answer. If you go, God, I want to obey you. I don't know how. I don't know what to do. He'll tell you. (laughs) Why? Because he wants the house to survive. Because he loves you and he cares for you. So the question for us today is, where's, where's God pushing you? If you call Christ your Savior, if you have faith, where where has he called you to obedience where we went, I'll obey over here, but I'm not so sure I want to do those. Think about that. Dwell on that. Confess it to him. It's okay. You can say, God, I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. He knows already. (laughs) Say it to him. He'll work in you. He will change your affections. I promise you that. I have experienced it. I have seen it. That's what God is in the business of doing. Not creating great robots that obey him, but changing our affections such that we want to serve the creator of the universe. Let me pray.